today we're going to focus all on wholesaling 101, subject to 101. I'll admit I'm fairly naive when it comes to this. And so this will be a great episode for me to pick up a lot of information on too. I'm going to ask our expert on the subject to really break it down for me as if I'm at the very beginning stages and, and really just trying to understand it. So welcome back to the channel, Mr. Scott Ulmer. Scott, thanks for coming back on. Hey, Matthew, thank you for having me. Honored to be here. So uh, you're obviously widely considered a specialist on especially subject twos, but of course, the wholesaling side of things too. How would you define each of those? Let's just go ahead and start there. Sure. So kind of 101 wholesaling is where you're tying up a property, almost always distressed in one way, financially, physically, or both, uh, and really assigning that to someone who wants to maybe take take it for what we call the long dollar. So wholesalers are usually in it to just assign it, make a little bit of a fee, and then you have an investor or someone that wants to do the full rehab or renovation, and ultimately they'll take it out and, and go through the process of getting it back to uh, market marketability and ultimately the sale on, on the long dollar. So wholesalers uh, as a whole are usually kind of in and out and and uh, certainly there are exceptions where they can make a lot of money, but most of the time you're in and out, you make a, a fee two to five thousand, two to ten thousand, somewhere in there. Again, exceptions there and, and uh, certainly wholesalers as a, will tell you they, they can make a lot more and that's certainly true, but but most of the time it's short dollar for in and out and you let kind of a, another investor take the, the long dollar that wants to do the renovation. Uh, subject two is it's a strategy that, that we kind of call unicorn behind the scenes because um, it, it has some moving parts. Most people don't really quite understand it. And uh, when you do understand it, logically, it, it doesn't always really make sense. Why would a seller do that, right? So a subject to what it means is that you, uh, as an investor, or are buying the home. You are taking legal title to the property, uh, but you are leaving the underlying mortgage that the uh, borrower or the person that's selling you the home in this case uh, initially got from the bank, that loan remains on the home and that borrower still remains personally responsible for the loan, yet they're giving you the legal title to the property. So the word subject to or the phrase comes from you're buying the home subject to the underlying mortgage remaining on the property. And so again, the question I always get is why would a seller do this? And it's a great question. Of course, motivation, which is the driver behind many things that don't make sense, especially in real estate, uh, can cause people to do things that may or may not make sense to, to you, but at the time it might be the best decision for them. So subject twos are a great way to build a portfolio without having to use your cash your credit. Uh, there, are, there are certainly uh, some things that would, would dictate what a subject to, would, what, what would trigger a subject to, why would a seller uh, look to do something like this. And obviously you have to know what to say and, and how to approach it, but, um, but it can be a great way to acquire homes and, and certainly a strategy that we've had a lot of experience with and, and a lot of success with, but, but does have some moving parts. So I guess I am a little bit confused then. I mean, w let's go back to that that point you bring up, it's a great point. Why would a seller do that? I mean, I, I understand there is an underlying motivation there, but tell me a little bit about what actually does motivate a seller to even consider doing something like this. Sure. So usually they, they, they have to be distressed. And, and, and what, what I have found in sub twos is, is most of the time it's financially. Now it certainly can be physical as well. And that just means the condition of the property. So physically uh, distressed means that the home would need work repairs of some sort. Uh, and obviously that can range from, you know, a coat of paint to obviously a full scale renovation. Financially distressed, which is really the driver for subject twos in my experience, it means the sellers behind uh, a payment, two payments, three payments, and, and uh, the outlook for them is, is pretty bleak. They, they, uh, uh, foreclosure is likely imminent um, and them being able to catch up the mortgage on their own is probably going to be unlikely. So now they're, they've probably resorted to the fact that they're not going to be able to stay in the home. Uh, in some cases, they have equity. So in a subject two, you'll give them a check, uh, at which point they kind of take their equity now and, and run with it and understanding the, the risk that's still in place. Uh, so they're going to get some of the money today as opposed to nothing and losing the home. So the value add as an investor showing up is that, look, you know, you can, you have, you know, 80,000 in equity that, that you're going to lose out on because you're getting ready to lose the property. If we could get you some of that today, um, you know, would that maybe be something you'd consider under the right circumstances? So in a case like that, we're, there are times when we'll pay the seller uh, basically to go, if you will. They'll get some of the equity today. Another scenario uh, with subject twos is if somebody's getting ready to lose the home to foreclosure, um, that's a uh, can do a number on your credit. And so obviously when you're behind multiple payments and, and you have a full-born 
loan foreclosure where the bank is taking the property back, um, you are not able to buy uh, without some exceptional type loans another home for, in some cases, three years or more. And that really stays on your credit for several years. And, and even if you weren't interested in buying a home again, it knocks your credit down so much that, that in all facets of your life, your credit's really going to be affected. So we've had deals where just by virtue of saving the house from going into a full-blown blown foreclosure was incentive enough for the seller to just walk away from the deal. And many times, Matthew, you, the seller's at a point mentally where, where they've checked out, uh, they've resorted to the fact they're not going to live there anymore. And, and in many cases, uh, when life is throwing you some pretty heavy curveballs, um, you're not caring as much as your credit. You're not really interested in maybe what the next step for home buying is or how your credit overall looks. And so, again, I, I boil that down to motivation, but, but, but we've dealt with those situations where the sellers are really just checked out and ready to go. And so when we're able to at least value add to them that we can save their credit, ultimately catch the loan up, uh, we'll make it current, uh, ultimately take care of the property and get it uh, cashed out of their name at some point down the road. We try not to commit to a window of time. Uh, but in cases like that, th there are benefits to the seller, which is obviously the reason they move forward. So whether it's just getting the, the foreclosure stopped and saving their credit from really some long-term pain uh, and or giving them some of their equity today, uh, of which they may not get any if the house goes into foreclosure, those are really the two primary uh, uh, opportunities or examples that, that we run into when it comes to, to subject twos. And let me just add one more tidbit. Um, and I, I will let you kind of direct where you want this to go. But but with, uh, obviously, the forbearances and, and a lot of that, the cha chatter around uh, the moratorium and all of the things that have gone on with how the government has helped prop up some of uh, the rentals as, as well as the, the foreclosures, um, we think, and, and statistics certainly pro uh, support this, that there's going to be a lot of folks that are behind a few payments. We think pre-foreclosures, um, NODs, notice of default, that type of scenario uh, we think is going to be relatively prevalent here in the coming months and going to be some good opportunities for for subject to type deals okay so you've sparked a lot of questions here so um you know i want to get back to what's most important to our listeners here because our listeners are obviously tuned into the channel for opportunity reasons i want to stay as focused on that during this video as we can but i guess i'm i can't help but be hung up a little bit on the liability aspect here for the seller right so as somebody that comes in and tries to poke holes in things i tend to be sort of a, a natural scrutinizer i'm wondering what what exactly are the risks here i mean if you're asking somebody that has a home where whereby they still have a mortgage and yes they're at risk of of uh you know long term default which eventually leads to foreclosure if you're not able to short sale the property. And of course, at this point, refinances are almost impossible every time because you're already missing payments. It's, a, it's a, it, This seems like a last ditch solution in a way, pre short sale, which again is even, you know, before you go to the foreclosure stage. So I get it. I get that there is sort of an imminent threat here, but how is this not a major risk to a seller who's signing a deed over, uh, but is still willingly liable for a 30 year note that uh, they no longer control the property on. And furthermore, how is a mortgage company, how is a lender agreeable to this in the first place? Whereby, you know, if you have a, a, a dishonest uh, subject to broker it, or whatever that they're referring themselves to as, I, I'm curious where, how does this not fall apart in some cases where you just hear about, uh, you know, fraud after fraud after fraud? What, what's, what's to say that somebody can't just take off with your home, so to speak? Sure. No, it's a great question. And, and again, it, you know, my, my mind gets hung up on that as well. Let me give you the two measures of protection or security that, that we offer our sellers. That This is, is, is absolutely a good nugget for, you, for your, your subscribers and watchers here. Uh, number one, when we are doing a subject to, uh, what we give as far as instruments or measure, measures of protection for the seller are really two things. First, we give them what's called a wrap mortgage, a wraparound mortgage. So if you have a mortgage on a property, that gives you the, the ability to foreclose on it. So we take legal title, 
we give, and there's going to be a first mortgage on the property already because there's a lender involved, and that's why it's a subject to, we're buying it subject to that loan remaining in place. But we can, now that we have legal title, we can give the seller a effectively a second mortgage. And it's called a wrap because it just wraps around the first mortgage. There's no payments. There's no uh, interest rate. Uh, there's not an accruing type of, of, of balance owed to the seller. It's just an instrument that they have. Should I fall off the face of the earth, God forbid, now they have a measure to to foreclose. So now that's a little hairy because they'd have to foreclose the first mortgage, but it does give them a measure of protection. The second one, Matthew, that, that is my favorite and, and, and is I have found to be kind of the the comfort level for, for our sellers when we do these deals is I tell them, look, at the closing, you're going to sign over the deed to my entity. I'm going to have the closing agent or my attorney prepare a deed from my entity right back to you. That's going to be held in escrow and with very simple instructions that say, if I miss three consecutive payments, let's say, God forbid, I get hit and killed by the proverbial bus, uh, you don't have to foreclose me. You don't have to track me down. You simply go to the closing agent or the title company or the attorney, uh, verify that three payments in a row have been missed, and you can simply record the deed and take legal title back. Uh, now, that's never happened because we don't enter into these to obviously not perform and, and we don't spend money and go through the whole process to not stand behind what we've committed to. Uh, uh, so that has never been used, but it's a, it's a feel good for them. And so not only do they have a mortgage, which again, there's some moving parts to that, but it does give them something. If they didn't have a mortgage, uh, a wraparound mortgage or, or the deed in escrow, uh, they have no way to, no recourse. So we, you know, you get a fly by night person or someone's trying to, to take advantage of the situation and they, they're none the wiser, the, the, the seller that's losing the property, um, they have no recourse. And so I've always found important to let them know these are your measures of protection. You have a mortgage and we, uh, again, I'm going to give you a deed right back to you. Now you can't go record. It's going to be held in escrow. Uh, but if I fall off the face of the earth, you don't have to find me. You simply go back to the title agency. We have an escrow agreement that says those specific instructions very clearly. So those are the protection measures for the uh, seller or the person that is in the home that's getting ready to lose it. As far as the lender's concerned, yeah, lenders aren't real crazy about subject twos. Um, uh, obviously, that's their collateral. In fact, I think it was 1979 when uh, 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 banks kind of universally instituted what's called the due on sale clause. And due on sale clause simply means that if you sell the property or transfer legal title, uh, that the collateral, which is the property, has to be satisfied before it can be transferred. Otherwise, the loan can be called due, due on the sale of the property. And that's really what it means very clearly. So what I found and, and, and uh, what seems to be the, the pattern, as long as payments are getting made, as long as the loan's current, as long as there's not uh, you know issues with the property from a physical standpoint, you're not getting a bunch of citations and city code enforcement violations, things of that nature, uh, the lender has no issue. They're not in the business of real estate. They just want to make sure the payments are made. And certainly Bank of America, Wells Fargo, they don't have people on staff checking titles of all of their millions of borrowers. Um, so if they did find out, and of course, uh, we do send them a letter that says we are now taking over, and, and um, but it goes in some, some file somewhere and, and likely doesn't get seen by, by anybody that would want to call the due on sale clause. So as long as payments are current, as long as uh, you are maintaining the property, there's usually not an issue. The only caveat, and I've got to say this, is that uh, if you're dealing with a small town, uh, local credit union type lender, uh, you know, where everybody knows everybody, um, that, that might be a little different. Um, I heard a story, I, I can't prove it, uh, but there was a gentleman in, in a small town out west that had done 10 or 11 subject to transactions. The, the city had fallen on some hard times and, and ultimately all of those loans were with like a local bank and local bank found out uh, and ultimately called those loans because of the fact that the, the collateral that they had transferred. And so, but aside from that, that one uh, example, um, in most cases, there's not going to be an issue with the lender as long as you maintain payments, maintain the property, and, and uphold kind of the agreement that, that the original borrower had. There's usually not issues with the lender, but they don't like it, to, to be very clear. So I think it probably goes without saying this is one of those business models that you want to make sure you do your homework, check your local rules. Guys, d just be very careful when you're getting in, into certain businesses that you're not stepping into something that ends up turning your life into a mess 
And uh, that goes with absolutely any business that you want to get into. Speaking of businesses, let's take this into the opportunity side of this conversation, uh, which is what we're all here for, because I see huge opportunity coming up. I know you do too. Uh, before we dive into that, make sure you guys write down the email address, pink at vipfinancialeducation.com, which will be in the description below as well. Shoot an email if by the end of this video, you are looking for a way that will help you break out of a nine to five, will give you the opportunity to add to your salary or wages from a 95, nine to five and have a side hustle. We have made countless videos surrounding what I have determined is one of the single most creative and effective business models that is related to the wholesaling side of real estate. And it's a very concentrated niche specialized model that allows your clients or your uh, partners or whatever you're calling these affiliates at this point, Scott, to make 10, 15, 20,000, and in some cases, even as much as $30,000, as we just saw in a video that we posted last week, per deal in profit. And that's with no money out of pocket. That's with no credit necessary. So for those of you guys that are looking for a way to sort of bypass the, uh, you know, the, the restrictions that come with trying to acquire your own portfolio, which is the long game of wealth creation. That is a long-term net worth investment solution versus a short-term net cash flow solution. If you're looking for that net, net cash flow solution where you're looking for windfalls of capital, 15K a month, 15K every, every 60 days, uh, 30,000 in a month, uh, just go into the playlist in the description below and start checking out all the videos from the various interviews that we've done on that business model because it is phenomenal what people are accomplishing month after month after month whereby uh, they're, they're, they're realizing those types of income levels on the side. So very exciting stuff. And what's really cool about it is while it isn't an inexpensive business to purchase, I think your sticker price on those at this point on the low side is 40,000, on the higher uh, business model is 65,000. Those are two separate membership options that are available. This is much less expensive than a typical business in a box would cost. And it's also what appears to be a fraction of what a lot of these big uh, seminar circuit companies, not to throw out any names, will charge you. They're right at that same price point. And yet when you get in, all they're really gonna leave you with uh, initially is start wholesaling. And, uh, and I think this is just a much better way to go about doing it. So pink at vipfinancialeducation.com is the email address, first name, last name, and phone number. Before you email, watch the playlist in the description below so that you get all your basic frequently asked questions answered. And go ahead and reach out and see whether or not a region uh, is still available in your area. I will tell you that if the cost of participation, either at that $40,000 level or $65,000 level, which by the way, those prices have always continued to go up. And I imagine they still are going to at some point. So the earlier you get in, the less expensive it will be. However, if the cost is a problem for you, there are solutions. So just make sure you note that in the email when you send uh, your email in that you may be in need of solutions regarding the price tag, whether it be financing options, whether it be uh, maybe a lower barrier of entry somewhere else where they can kind of get you off the ground um, without necessarily uh, full participation at the moment uh, or a delayed participation type of uh, a solution. I don't know. All I know is they're willing to get uh, everybody help that wants it and is serious enough about uh, running their own business uh, using their model. So guy, I think we're going to have to call it for today just to keep the video uh, manageable. But Scott, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, my man. Matthew, it's my pleasure. Thank you. All right, guys. Everybody have a good day. And uh, don't forget, keep on cash flowing. Talk to you soon. That's a great way to get your feet wet with education surrounding real estate, with networking surrounding real estate, uh, with finding deals in real estate. And I think it's one of the best kept secrets surrounding investing 